Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name, well, I think most of you know me, but anyway, my name, for those of you who don't know me, is Mario Relic, and I chair the Writers for Peace Committee of Scottish Pen. Tonight's session is by the Writers for Peace Committee and Dovetails, chaired by Jean Rafferty. Jean and I are co-chairing co the, the session. The title of this session is The Age of Im Impunity, because it will deal with some of the main sources of instability in the world today and the reckless impunity which some of the world's leaders threaten uh, uh, global peace. One recent example was a devastating shopping center attack on civilians, which occurred in a Ukraine town yesterday. David Miliband, and I don't mean Ed Miliband, I mean David Miliband, chief executive of the International Rescue Com Committee used this very phrase, the age of impunity, in an interview with Channel 4 News last night. The first speaker will be the human rights professional and activist Alexis Krikorian. Alexis Krikorian, yeah. Other participants with their own observations and poetry readings will be from the Scottish literary scene. Over to you, Jean. Hi, thank you very much, Mario. Um, I'm delighted to be here having a joint event with, with Scottish Pen. Um, I think that we all have been absolutely devastated by what's happened in Ukraine and um, other places previously, um, which haven't had as much coverage. Um, so I'm going to introduce um, Alexis Krikorian. I met uh, Alexis through Scottish Pen at a Pen conference, actually. And um, he runs a, a charity which campaigns for Armenians. Um, Alexis has written a, a really powerful book um, which is called Toxic Neutrality. And um, I, I think we have seen various forms of that uh, going on uh, in the world at the moment. Um, I'd like him to explain it. Alexis, can you explain what that term means and how you came, uh, came to, okay. to choose it? Well, thank you. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Dovetails and uh, Scottish Pen for having me tonight. I'm delighted to, to be here with you all. Um, the term toxic neutrality for the time being belongs mostly to the gaming world where it refers to those players who um, actively choose neutrality in a battle between good and evil. And uh, I think it would be a pity if it remained confined to the, to the, to the virtual world as it has real impacts, real consequences in the real world in terms of perpetuating human rights violations and uh, persecution. Um, the term came to me, uh, uh, as you said, some wars are, are less covered than others. And the, the, the term uh, came to me during the Second Karabakh War in, uh, in September, October, and November uh, 2020, when I witnessed the uh, non-reaction of the international community uh, to, to, and I, by that I mean mostly Western powers and, and Russia, uh, to, to this war initiated uh, on the 27th of September by, uh, by Azerbaijan with the full support of Turkey, uh, Turkish generals, the famous or infamous, uh, depending um, by Raktar drones, even Turkish uh, special forces and Syrian mercenaries. Uh, unleashed a very, very, uh, very, um, very strong war on, on Armenians uh, at that moment. And uh, as I said, the, 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 Western, the Western powers and Russia were, were neutral. I'll just give one example. Um, US, then US State Secretary Mike Pompeo said, talked about Karabakh, uh, Artsakh by its Armenian name, uh, uh, region as a piece of real estate. So I think in Trumpian terms, it meant that the highest bidder uh, could grab it, really. Um, also in the media, it was not reported at all. It went completely under the radar or when it was- We, did, we didn't read about it at all in the UK. Mm. I, don't, I don't remember seeing a single article. Yeah, no, no, it's, uh, or, or when it was reported, and I think that Armenia actually lost the war on the ground, but also the information war, because uh, when it was reported, I think it was ill reported with the use of terms by some media or the press agencies like AFP, writers of the, of Azerbaijani sponsored terms like Armenian separatists to refer to the local indigenous Armenian population. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's a loaded term, isn't it? It's very loaded. Yeah, at least, at least a, a much, uh, frankly, I think a, a more neutral term for the for the media to use would have been at least uh, independentists. You know, people yeah. seeking independence. <laughs> so less loaded than separatists, really. Yeah. Uh, which, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, but of Very course, it's an age-old reality. Uh, you know, I, I spotted um, a, a quote by Desmond Tutu who said, and I'm going to to. To read it, if if an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse, uh, and you say that you are neutral, the, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. <laughs> well, in that case, uh, Armenia and Karabakh, uh, in a demographic ratio of one to thirty to Turkey and Azerbaijan, three million people on one side, ninety million people on the other side. Uh, they are the mouse, and Turkey and Azerbaijan are the uh, are the elephant, really. And during this war, uh, all civilians, Armenian civilians, had to leave, um, and four thousand uh, Armenian soldiers were killed. Uh, most of them were young men between the age of eighteen and twenty-two. And uh, just to give a, a, an example, um, it is as if in a forty-four day war. Uh, the United Kingdom had lost uh, 90,000 uh, soldiers, in, on, especially young men between 18 and 22, facing armies from a block of countries of 2 billion people in relation to the size of the United Kingdom. Uh, that's almost China and India put together. So yes, the imbalance of, uh, of power there was, uh, was really, really crazy. Uh, so. Just yeah, toxic neutrality is um, in a nutshell is a is a false, morally wrong, I believe, uh, equivalence uh, between the uh, the aggressor and the uh, and the aggrieved, which in fact is um, is an endorsement uh, uh, that doesn't say its name of uh, of the aggressor, uh, which is seen as a positive agent of uh, in a way of international law. And it, uh, it can only reinforce the impunity that's tonight's subject in that case of, uh, of, uh, of Baku and, uh, and Ankara. Uh, yeah. I, I think, you know, we, we've talked about this, Alexis, that um, had the international community taken more notice of what happened in Karabakh, maybe Ukraine would not have happened. Maybe Putin would not have felt that he had impunity to go in there. Yeah, no, I I, I agree to, to to support Ukraine in in, in twenty twenty two is to support um, uh, a democracy um, with its flaws, but a democracy being attacked by an imperialist autocrat uh, with its many more flaws. And I think that in twenty twenty, yes, uh, the the West. Uh, I said Russia earlier, but in that case, let's focus on, on the West, um, um, accepted that war of aggression against uh, the Armenians, against Armenian democracy, because in the local context, Armenia, with its flaws, uh, is a democracy attacked by uh, what I can best describe as imperialist autocracies with their many more flaws. And, um, and yes, uh, I'm sure that somehow emboldened Putin to invade uh, Ukraine in 22 to see that there was absolutely no reaction to, to, to that war of invasion in, 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 20, in 2020. And um, an NGO called Freedom House in, it, uh, in its report, Nations in Transit 22 said that, and uh, I will actually read um, what they wrote in that report. Aliyev's evident success in using military aggression uh, to reinforce his rule may have contributed to Vladimir Putin's decision to invade Ukraine in February uh, 2022. And uh, it's extremely worrying because, of course, tomorrow everyone thinks that it could be um, also Taiwan's turn. Yeah, yeah. Well, many, many other places, I think, must be worried. And we'll, we'll talk to, to Donald a, a wee bit later about that. Um, in the, the, the situation in Ukraine has become um, a kind of proxy war, hasn't it? We're talking about neutrality and how the West hasn't done enough, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to the international community hasn't done enough 
to object to these acts of aggression. Um, but when you um, ap ap apply that to Ukraine, we've only got the appearance of neutrality. We say we're not taking part in a war. And then we send billions of pounds mm. worth of weapons to the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, yes, sorry. Yeah, it's like a, a proxy war mm -hmm. um, between the West and, and Russia yeah. on our side. Yeah, I think on both sides, um, uh, the, the West is fighting a, 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 a proxy war in, in the Ukraine. I think uh, you mentioned figures, but uh, as early, for instance, as the 20th, 27th of February, so three days after the invasion of Ukraine, uh, Borrell, um, the um, equivalent of the EU foreign minister, uh, wrote an article in The Guardian um, saying that the EU would provide uh, weapons for Ukraine's armed forces, saying it's a matter of life and death. And uh, of course, I think the, the expression was a bit, uh, a bit funny because any war is a, is a matter of, uh, of life and, and death. Uh, President Biden, you mentioned figures, signed a $40 billion Ukraine assistance bill in May. And um, also I noted another example, Foreign Secretary uh, Liz Truss declared that she absolutely supports uh, British citizens who want to volunteer uh, to fight in defense of, of the Ukraine. But conversely, I, uh, and to some extent, uh, I think it's also um, a proxy war for Putin um, to, to a proxy war yeah, with NATO and, and the United States for Russia. Certainly, its great power status um, is, at, uh, is at stake. Um, but also what we noticed lately is that US ambitions have um, have escalated from supporting Ukraine defend itself to, to, to weakening Russia so much that it uh, cannot do uh, another such invasion in future. And um, on the 19th of June, so less than 10 days ago, the uh, NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg said that this war could last for years. And um, so the prospect, of course, of a settlement seems further away uh, than, than ever. And we've seen, as uh, uh, Mar Mario mentioned uh, yesterday's horrific bombing of a shopping mall, a signal that uh, Putin is, uh, is not ready to, 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 to compromise. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, I think a question we should ask, be asking ourselves as, uh, as representative of uh, as NGOs is, um, is uh, um, Shouldn't there be a, a settlement with a, with compromise um, instead of a war that could last for years? And you know all the suffering that goes with it. I remember during the forty four day war, I could tell you that uh, all the Armenians were every minute, <laughs> every hour, and every every day of that forty four day war were 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 hoping, were praying for for a ceasefire to uh, to happen. Now the question is, of course, at what costs and the subject tonight is impunity. And of course, I, I, I absolutely think there should be no compromise on impunity. I mean, Russia started the war. Uh, there are war crimes, there are crimes against humanity and those who, uh, who are responsible for these crimes uh, should be tried for, for the sake of justice, uh, for the sake of, uh, of the victims. Yeah. It's, it's highly unlikely that that will happen, isn't it? I mean, one of the things that all of these wars have in common is that um, they're about money and they're about provision of energy. And in the West, we've said, oh, we're going to cut off Russian gas. But yeah. in fact, that's not going to happen till the end of the year. Um, mm -hmm. And I suspect that the leaders are hoping that the war will be over. But if they keep on supplying weapons, they won't, will they? Um, it's, it's all to do with energy. And that that is a great part of what happened in Karabakh, yeah? Yeah, as well, you know, as the houses were burning, as people were fleeing their homes, as, uh, as, as young men, soldiers were being uh, killed by, by Raktar drones, um, the TAP, the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline, 
the last leg, the European leg of the 40 billion uh, euro uh, Southern European gas corridor uh, project labeled one of Europe's most strategic projects actually uh, started delivering gas to Europe from the Caspian Sea in, uh, in Azerbaijan. Uh, we're talking the day after the, the ceasefire in, um, in, uh, in November 2020. And as you said, it shows that energy, the supply of energy and the security of energy supply and wars are, are very much linked and that there are a lot of connections between politicians, high level politicians and energy circles. Um, just to name a few, uh, Tony Blair, for instance, was, uh, was hired as a lobbyist for the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline in, um, in, um, in 2014. Um, here's, here's a few of them. Are, are you... Oh, this is, uh, this is a picture from 2006, the inauguration of another pipeline, the BTC oil pipeline from Azerbaijan to Turkey. And there you have, it's 2006, but you have the CEO of, um, of BP, John Brown, uh, Aliyev and Erdogan were already in power, and the two others are no longer in power. Um, and you see the pipeline, but you also see on this day of the inauguration of the pipeline that if you look closely, Armenia is the, is the smallest country on this map, and you see that this, the south of Armenia uh, has disappeared. And instead, you see that there is a link, a uh, direct land connection between Azerbaijan and, and, and Turkey. Um, and um, I believe that this was uh, one of the war goals of Azerbaijan in Turkey in the fall of uh, 2020 to, 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 to realize, to, to make that land connection between their two countries happen. This is an old pan-Turkic dream to, to have such a land connection opening Turkey to the Caspian Sea and to the vast speaking um, uh, Turkish, uh, Turkish world, uh, Turkish speaking world. Um, and of course, there is a strong connection between BP and, uh, and Azerbaijan, and this goes back to 1992 when former uh, uh, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher delivered in person a $30 million uh, check on behalf of BP to, to the Azerbaijani government. So this is an, uh, but of course, it is also true in other contexts and Ukraine and Russia, Gerhard Schroeder, the former, um, former German chancellor, is still on the supervisory board of, um, of Gazprom, uh, for instance, uh, but he's been heavily criticized in, in Germany and um, uh, the German prosecutor uh, initiated a, a procedure for crimes against humanity against Gerhard Schroeder actually in, uh, in March 22. Uh, we will see where, where that goes, but it's, uh, it's a good sign I think for yeah, I, I, we can't. I, I think we can't be too hopeful, can we? Given that Putin has has walked away from Crimea and Georgia and um, Azerbaijan after having at, attacked um, Armenia, were mm -hmm. then rewarded financially. Uh, who? Sorry. Um, Azerbaijan, having attacked Armenia, were then yeah, yeah. rewarded financially by America. Yes, by, uh, well, you know, I mean, as the war in Ukraine was looming, I mean, on, in February 22, uh, uh, Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General, uh, publicly thanked Azerbaijan for being a reliable energy supplier uh, to, uh, to Europe. Um, and also, for instance, on the day that Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi spoke with President Aliyev to deepen the um, energy cooperation between Italy and Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan uh, cuts the gas supply to Karabakh, and it's 120,000 uh, people, as a cold snap was happening. And there was a humanitarian crisis, not reported at all in international press, uh, that uh, the entire civilian population of Karabakh was cut off from gas, and we're talking homes, schools, uh, hospitals. Uh, and um, yes, uh, after the war, Europe was going to give uh, in investments to Armenia 2.6 billion euros and 150 million euros to Azerbaijan. But uh, this was changed because Azerbaijan complained. And three months later, uh, an EU commissioner went to Baku and announced that the EU would invest at least 2 billion 
uh, 2 billion euros uh, in, in Azerbaijan as well. So even that, which could have been seen as a very light form of punishment for initiating a war, uh, was, um, well, did, was, did yeah. happen. And uh, yeah, so it's uh, the, the rewards uh, for Azerbaijan. I mean, now, right now, uh, Azerbaijan has, uh, has a lot of leverage on the yeah. West, as, uh, as the West is, is trying to cut off Russian gas. But what people don't know, and maybe I'd like to stress that, is that 20% uh, of Azerbaijani gas, for instance, is owned by uh, Lukoil, Russia's energy giant. Uh, the deal was made also, interestingly, three weeks before the start of the, of, uh, the invasion of Ukraine, um, which means that every time um, uh, Britain or EU uh, by, uh, by five euros or five pounds of Azerbaijani gas, one, uh, one euro goes to Russia and potentially fund Russia's war effort. Yes. But of course, uh, we, we don't talk about it. <laughs> so. no, no. Well, thank you very much. That's been so interesting. And what I'm going to do is I'm going, uh, Alexis uh, made some uh, notes for this meeting. I'm going to paste them into the chat because so that people can um, study it later, you know, it's, it, I think we know very little about this war and, but it's made a pattern for what's happening in Ukraine. And per, perhaps I think, Mario, we're going to hear a bit more um, about another country which is being affected by the war now. I'll hand over to you, Mario. Right, so, um, oh yes, I'm interviewing Donald. Donald? Ah, there you are. Hello, hello, hello. Mario. <laughs> hello. Um, yeah, um, I, well, uh, Donald will be reading some of his poems later, so I'll give a fuller introduction then. But for the moment, um, what you need to know is that Donald is a Scottish poet who lives with his family in uh, Finland. Um, so I just just briefly look at uh, what's going on in Finland. So I've, I've got a few <laughs> questions here. Um, well, my first question is, are memories of Russia's war in Finland just before World War II relevant to the situation with Finland and Russia now? Because during, uh, I think just before World War II, Russia invaded Finland, didn't it? Yes, yes. In, 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 yes. Uh, the, the, I suppose, I, I don't know if you can call it a compromise, but they ceded some territory to Russia. Okay. Although Finland was, I think, also under Russia's thumb in many ways, even though it was um, uh, during the Cold War. But anyway, I'll let you um, well, um, comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> it wasn't just a little bit of Finland that was uh, taken by Russia after uh, the Winter War. Yeah, uh, it, it was a very large chunk of Finland. Oh right, of, of the south, uh, uh, especially Karelia. Yes, uh, which was taken, including one of the largest cities of the, <clears throat> one of the most international mm. cities was, was Vipuri, uh, which uh, was taken by by Russia. Um, but just. I, I, I'm, I'm no expert really on these, and it's extraordinarily complicated because sure, there wasn't just sure. one war, but there was two wars. <clears throat> there was a war, the Winter War, which ended with, uh, with Russia taking a large chunk of Finland. And mm. then there was the Continuation War, at which time Finland was allied with Germany. Yeah. <clears throat> and and uh, that ended, of course, the way it ended. And, uh, Finland very fortunately or very adroitly wasn't occupied um, by any country after in, in, in 1945. Mm. <clears throat> and thereafter, you could say, I don't know if under the thumb is the right word because it was what's often referred to contemptuous, rather contemptuously as mm. Finlandization. Um, yes. In fact, uh, Finland was, was had a pretty high degree of independence, so uh, ah. uh, even at that time, although the politicians... So do you, so yes, do you think it was Cold War propaganda? 
I wouldn't say, well, well I, I think there yeah. has been an element of, of, of propaganda about that since. Uh, yes. Um, um, it, it, it's a lot more complicated than, than people say. And one doesn't realize how much Finland gained from that period called mm. the Cold War through yes. trade with Russia. They had a very uh, economically successful in many ways through mm. the goods that were supplied as quote, war reparations to Russia, but developed the industry of Finland um, mm. in, in a way, developed quite a bit of the country's prosperity during the second half of the, mm. uh, of the 20th century. Um, All right. Mm. But yeah, I mean, of course the memories are there very much so. Um, yeah. uh, Sure. Of, of the winter war and of the... Do, do you know what the percentage of territory was that was taken over? I should have researched that, but <laughs> I think it... I think it would be something in the region of 20%, but... 20%, I right. Say. It yeah. was a big chunk of the most productive and most developed part of the country. Yeah. Uh, not yeah. to say something up in the north as well, there was mines the yes. nickel mines, cobalt mines up in the north of the country, and the yeah. access to the to the yeah. uh, to the Arctic Ocean as well was lost. So but, these are things, the yeah. whole history there. But, but, it, but yeah. in, interestingly, some historians think that Hitler was fooled into invading Russia because he thought, well, the, if even the Finns can defeat them, surely we can. <laughs> But I don't know how, how yeah. correct this historian is. Uh, I think you'd have to ask. <laughs> yeah. I, I, that's the impression I've gained. Anyway, yes, yes. That, that was a, a, a reason, one reason why Hitler yeah. thought it would be an easy task to march yeah. into to Russia. Yeah. But yeah. Performance of the Russians have not been great in, in the Winter War. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So, my next question. Uh, uh, how is the Russian war against Ukraine affecting the general public in Finland, as well, far as you know? Yeah. I think it has totally swung opinion into joining NATO, and that's a pretty radical step. Yeah. Because up until yeah. then, up until the invasion of Ukraine, the majority of people in Finland was, were, were against joining NATO. Sure. Because it was thought that neutrality had been a benefit. Yeah. And yeah. friendly relations with Russia had been, which they definitely were. Economically, yeah. there's plenty of economic economic links with Russia. Yeah. Uh, that has come to a dead end, pretty much. Yeah. Um, so yes. But is is there any opposition to such a move? Yes, uh, I. There is, and I can't tell you the percentages, but I think you know, there's yeah. something like um, something like still about a third, twenty-five or thirty percent of people who would be opposed <laughs> to joining NATO. Right. And I know people myself who are, yeah, um, in the British yeah. community, uh, for example, in Finland. Yes. Mm. Okay. I think a lot of us here might be. Excuse me. I think yeah. a lot of us here might be against. They do. Yes. Yes. Not <laughs> joining NATO. Yes. Any expansion of NATO. Yeah. Well, I think I think we should open the discussion to everyone now. Any anybody have any questions or observations? Sir? Unless you want to have any final words, uh, Donald. No, I'll leave it because I'm I'm due to read a bit later on. And uh, you are, the, yes, yes, yes. One yes, of the points yes. uh, actually right, concerns right. this uh, yeah. this the emotion and what's the feelings of people. So yeah, yeah. Leave it there just now. Could so I, it, can I ask a question, Donald? Yeah. Um, this this business of Finland trying to join NATO. If I was living there, uh, I think I would be very anxious about it because Finland has a long, long border with Russia and well, they're the final outpost of... That's you know, very that true. And, and, and I'll say, I'm going to read something on that. Um, of course, yes. Uh, when you have a thousand miles of border with a, another country, um, mm. which has a just shown itself that can launch an army of 120, 200,000 people against mm -hmm. another country. Well, in, you're, you're certainly going to, 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 to make you, well, I'll read that later. I'll talk about mm. it, say something else yeah. actually later on that, perhaps, yeah. yeah. Okay. Any, anybody else or? Oh, well, 
in, in, in that case, the gone to Bashabi who's not here. <laughs> so, so I mean, I mean, she's left us with two poems. So I don't know, may, maybe Jean and I should re read each poem. Okay. What, what do you think, Jean? Yeah. Yes. But, uh, she, she, should do, does she need an introduction, do you think? Or? Oh, yes, definitely. Okay, okay, I'll give. Very eminent woman, Bashabi. Well, she is indeed, she is indeed. Uh, yeah, okay. So, um, Dr. Bashby Fraser, CBE, is an award-winning poet, children's writer, editor, translator, and academic. Bashby's work traverses continents in bridge-building literary projects. She has authored and edited 23 books, published several articles and chapters, both academic and creative, and as a poet, has been widely anthologized. She's the recipient of, of a CBE, uh, 2021 Queen's, Queen's New Year's Honours list, and has been, um, and she was declared out, outstanding woman of Scotland by the Saltar Society in 2015. Um, so I just want to add that uh, she's on the board of Scottish Pen, and she also happens to be uh, a member of um, Writers for Peace, even though she's not here at the moment. But never mind. So <laughs> anyway, uh, her most recent book is Patient Dignity. A translation, a, a translate, uh, sorry, a transnational collection of poems and, and paintings by the artist Reba Pankaj, Pankaj that compares Scotland to India. So uh, let's go on to her poems then. Uh, yeah, sunflower. Uh, well, um, so I'll read the sunflowers and you, and you can read the push chairs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, yeah. I'll read the sunflower ones. Sunflower seeds, an offering. As the gloom gathers around her, she sees him standing, gun in hand, in her, her precious hand. This man sent by a destroyer to claim her street and force her retreat to her cellar and cower. She is frail but bold. She walks to him and holds out a handful of seeds, telling him to heed her words and treasure, and treasure them in his pocket as a safety measure. So when all the rockets sent by his destroyer bolster the determination of the defenders of her nation, he will fall and not return. But the seeds will see the sun, the flowers that will spring in a new beginning that will heal his dark deeds and see her land relieved. Uh, okay, well, I, 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 sh I should just add, I, I'm sure that something must have happened beyond her control. Uh, Bashabi, she's, she doesn't usually, she's usually very reliable. But anyway, <laughs> now for Jean. Well, this, this poem is called Push Cares in Leviv City Square. They are parked with intention, not abandoned with despair, but left as a testimony to the calculated fear sent to destroy their morale and willpower. These pushchairs now emptied of innocence and promise, little lives without enmity, without rancor or blemish, bombed and splintered with demonic relish. They stand as witnesses to the force of evil, unleashed by one man's capacity to revel in the flattening of hope and all that is civil. Little feet will not scamper. Oh dear, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it's very touching. Little feet will not scamper with adventurous relish. Little hands will not reach for the beauty and promise this earth had preserved for their nurture in a future that can no longer be conserved. They won't see the candles multiply on a cake. They won't feel the free wind as they swing in the park. They will never know the joy of new words, of dancing and painting, of the music of birds. But they will live as little flames in the hearts that gave them names. And these push chairs will now bear the story of each life that was true and rare. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. So, a very, they have a real emotional punch. Mm. Both poems, yeah. I think. Mm. Mario, um, you're going to introduce Donald properly yes. now. Yes, um, <laughs> yeah, I'll do that. Yes, no, I, th I thought those poems deserved 
a bit of silence and then <laughs> so anyway uh, so, so th this is now the full introduction to donald <laughs> um, donald adamson is a poet and translator currently living in finland and scotland in 1995 he was awarded a scottish arts council writer's bursary he has lived in france the middle east and finland and has translated finnish poems for how to address the fog um, fi uh, fin uh, sorry the book is called How to Address the Fog, Finnish Poems, 1978-2002, published by Karkanet in the Scottish Poetry Library. Um, also song texts for the Sibelius, Sibelius Academy Helsinki and mm -hmm. for the world music group Var, um, Vartina. He, he compiled a landscape blossoms with, within me translation of the Finnish poet Eva Kil, um, Kilpi. Uh, arc publications and his collection all coming back was recently published by roncadora publications donald co-founded co the scottish arts and literature magazine markings uh, and has been a prize winner in several poetry competitions his poem false prophets which in 1999 won the herald Mac uh, millennium poetry competition is buried in, in a time cap capsule under the walls of the scottish uh, poetry library uh, of course, many of his poems are in Scots. Now, uh, he also contributed to the um, um, Scottish pen publication Declarations on the Declaration of, of Our Brute. Okay, Donald, could you have your poems now? Okay, okay. Um, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I yeah. can anyway. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, just picking up the uh, invasion. Uh, of Ukraine and what happened then, and the the change of mood, <clears throat> and it got me to think that there there have been rights and wrongs, no doubt, leading up to this, and in the <clears throat> negotiation and in the events in two thousand and fourteen and uh, and 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 thereafter. Um, <clears throat> but in a way, it becomes kind of irrelevant, or feels irrelevant, when you're a country in a country that's directly threatened by 200,000 soldiers. Um, I mean that Vladimir Putin has said, I think, I, I, that he wants to reclaim the former Soviet empire, which would include the Baltic countries of um, mm. Estonia, Latvia, and, and Lithuania. And um, not only that, he has uh, seemed to imply that he, he would repudiate the agreement made by Lenin with Finland, uh, allowing Finland's a granting or uh, Finland's independence in 1917, mm -hmm. uh, which goes rather further than not just the former Soviet empire, but the entire Tsarist mm -hmm. empire. And I'm feeling, it's pretty clear that if he had the chance, and if he wasn't dissuaded, he would go right ahead and do it. So when you're in a country that is being directly threatened with destruction, your perspective becomes clearer. And yeah. um, <clears throat> you can say, shouldn't join, should join it, or shouldn't have joined, et cetera, et cetera. And now we're between two dictators, Putin and Erdogan, but we are where we are. <clears throat> and the situation encompasses being afraid. And I think if you don't admit you're afraid, I think you're either superhuman or super macho or faking it. And so this poem is called In Time of War from a country on Putin's hit list. <clears throat> As the war draws closer with pictures of a little girl killed, a mother wailing, a mud-stained rescuer digging through rubble. I chide myself that I don't yet weep within, that my outrage is helpless, numbed, not a dam bursting behind a skull. <clears throat> Others, I have the impression, on seeing these images, feel and act more nobly, with true empathy, cursing aloud, tearful, I ponder the reasons that the war is still distant enough to hope that it will slow, judder, and stop 
before the tanks come or the bombs, that hope makes the recorded grief of others more bearable than my own half anticipated griefs. I mean that unfeelingness is my soul's armor donned out of fear. Yes, I am afraid. Others, I suspect, fear less, feel more, and weep. Okay, the more just about the most powerful anti-war poem I know was is in French. Um, it's based on the, the French song Girofle Girofla, a children's song. Now the text of the poem was written in 1935 by the German Jewish poet Rosa Holt, who became a refugee in France after Hitler's rise to power. Now, the basic idea is that no matter how happy you are with your house and your garden and your family, the soldiers will come and shoot and rape and kill. And uh, by the way, the French version was sung by Yves Montan, and it has a singing, it covers a big range of notes, an octave and a half. Now, I'm going to try and sing it, but I'm struggling, I'm quavering, I'm afraid. Uh, so I, I, I beg your indulgence, really. It starts high, starts low, and it goes high. Is the, the, the thing here? Jeva hus is snug and canty, roses red, roses braw. Eva garden scents and blossom as the late birds taw. But the moon sigh grow in the reader, roses red, roses braw. Bonzo blast it. Oh, bonzo, blast it all. Oh. Ye bonny fields of barley, roses red, roses braw. And the corn is full of promise, for the herst is it now. But the forge is glow in the reader, roses red, roses braw. Guns will give her it all, oh. guns will give her it all. Oh. Eva hus with bonny lasses, summer teens, summer small. In a sparkling face is joyful, love is shared to fall. But the sodgers in the valley, roses reap, roses braw. Gan to rape them all, gan to rape them all. Ye his sons is strong and tender, roses reap, roses braw. See them singing, juke and playing, with a bat and ball, but they'll soon be tacking fray ye, roses reed, roses braw, and be food for the craw, and be food for the craw. For as long as there are sodgers, yours, your son, mine, and all, there'll be nathan good in earth, or wealth, or worth, or law. They'll shoot you down and leave you in the glore and the snow. Nathan gained the war, Nathan gained the war. Okay, pretty, pretty stark stuff. And I, I recommend you to listen to Yves Montan on YouTube, type in Girofle, Girofla, Yves Montan, and you'll get the, you'll, you'll get the song there. I finished by this poem, called The Window. I'm delighted to have this poem in Jerry Lucy's new anthology called The Earth is Our Home. Uh, it turned into a kind of ode to trifle, uh, which rises steeply from the Solway coast. And I looked onto it from my home outside Dumfries, and I, I, I somehow think of it as my hill. I wanted to end in a kind of almost hopeful, at least hopeful note. When I think of home, I do not think of walls, rooms, or a roof, but a window and the hill I saw from it all through my childhood. Spring mist bonnet, blue heat haze in summer, autumn cloud cap, wintry tip of frost. Not mine, but on a lease whose rent is paid in every breath I take. And if I'm allowed, 
in ashes cast some day on the hill's flank. I don't possess it, can't bequeath it, yet I wish the same for all who wander earth from want or war or new made boundaries that they may keep a loveliness within, a window to look out from, a simple square framing, hugging, an abiding memory, a sense of their belonging, mirror clear, whatever the train of years or hope, if hope there is of a return, this is the place that made me what I am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Our, our next reader um, is a poet I met at the Beyond Borders Festival, actually. Um, I didn't know her at all. Um, I was a judge and she won uh, the, the competition um, that year. Uh, there were three sections and we're going to hear another uh, award-winning poet later as well. Um, she's originally from Northern Ireland and now lives in Ayrshire. Um, she focuses on philosophical, political and life experience themes and she's been widely published uh, in the UK and Ireland and the US uh, and in our Dovetails anthology, I believe. Um, in 2019, she won the Waterways Story Making Festival and Imprint Writing Awards and was long listed for the Over the Edge New Writer of the Year. And in 2020, she was mentioned with honours in the Cinnamon Pencil Award. Caroline Johnson. Hi there, thank, thank you for having me tonight. So I've got three poems to read and the first one's called Shining Armour and there's an epigraph with it which I'll just read which comes from Homer's Iliad. So he, Ares, spoke and ordered Deimos, terror and Phobos, fear, to harness his horse <coughs> and himself got into Shining Armour. Shining Armour. Comrade Putin is a man of suits and discipline who thinks for Russia on his daily swim, thinks of absolute power, thinks he's a knight in shining armour, thinks about his expansionist heroes, Ivan the Terrible, Catherine the Great, thinks like a stalker wanting to embrace what once was his, thinks how to harness the twin gods of terror and fear, thinks that children are collateral damage, Thinks what to keep up his sleeve to whip the world into submission. Thinks people won't step out of line until they do. Mm. And let's hope that happens more and more. And then the second one's called The War Machine. The war machine awakes. It stirs itself to life, gets ready, then gets fueled by fear's usual worn out reasons. Revenge religion, a way of life protected, an avid greed for land, <clears throat> resources, people, power. No need to open eyes that close with hate. It stretches from its hibernation to lumber forward, forked tongue licking lips that bleed mass graves of sightless, limbless, genocidal pawns. Death and destruction ride shotgun as each tooth a craftsman engineered to um, slit and split, rips up world borders into problematic shapes, forever alters humans, hearts and homes. The monster bloated, rumbles on to final conquests, then belching, halts at trading points of fortunes kept or made, or white flags flying at half-mast and risky bets and peace agreements. With conscience clear, again it sleeps, with one eye open. Mm. Then the final one's called the, the Number Crunchers. Game on. Their sleeves rolled up around the clock, they munch the figures that harmless, guiltless in themselves prove nothing. Behind closed doors, big data is digested, tested and dissected. Big Brother hiding secrets from the common men who sleep. 
Number crunchers spin them deftly into patchwork quilts of silken lies, threads that twist fake news, converting it to truth by two strokes of the pen or the push of a button. They do the math and light the touch paper. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Okay, I'll, um, Liz now. Um, so uh, Liz is chair of Writers in Exile and editor of Pennings Magazine. Uh, her poetry collections includes Stravagan, Burning Winds, The Shard Box, um, in the shard box from Lewis Press. Public and art collaboration includes text in stones and wood, um, in stone and wood. The author of Scott's dossier for European Bureau, Bureau of Minority Languages. She has edited a wide range of literature, including New Writing Scotland, ASLS, and various education, that's the publisher, and various education resources of poetry and Scots language. Awards include Makash Poetry Prize, Saltar. Uh, Tess, Saltar Tess. She's an honorary fellow of the Association of Scottish Literary Studies and convener of Scottish Pens Writers in Exile Committee. She's going, oh yeah, she's going to read her poems from the forthcoming edition of Pennings Magazine. Oh. You have to unmute Liz. Is this there somewhere? Oh. oh, there you are, there you are, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was ignoring my clicking completely. <laughs> thanks very much, Mario, and thanks for inviting me to come along tonight. Um, I'm going to uh, read a couple of pieces. I, every, twice a year when we edit pennings, we always invite um, a guest editor. Ruth Aylett is the current guest editor of the magazine which is about to come out and be published very soon and we always have an international featured writer and so we decided that there was this one it would be really good to have a Ukraine writer so as you can imagine it was quite complicated um, getting a hold of somebody in the midst of what's happening um, for, for the international writer we usually require a, a, a biography an example of the work and a photograph and uh, Lyuba Yakimchuk was incredibly helpful and gave us all of these when we asked for them. She had actually read at Stanza, in fact, this year. Um, so we sort of followed a trail of paperwork and contacts and managed to get a hold of Lyuba, and, and it's been really great to have her. Um, so that, that's, that's the main one that I'm going to talk about, first of all. Um, and just to say also that twice a year when Penny's comes out, we have a theme, we always have a theme, and the theme for this one, which is always chosen by the guest editor. So the last guest editor chose gifting. Uh, Norwell um, was his own language for this, the word gifting, and so the theme, loosely the theme, has been gifting for this one. Um, the, the, next, the next theme and deadline will come out quite soon. It'll probably be late, much later on in the year, because it's just coming out in the current one at the moment. So Liuba Yakimchuk is a poet, a screenwriter and playwright. She was born in 1985 in Ukraine and she lived in Kiev. But because of the Russian massive invasion, had to evacuate with her son to Vienna. She is the author of several full-length poetry collections, including Apricots of Donbass, which was listed in the top 10 books about the war by Forbes magazine rating in Ukraine. In 2015, Kev's New Time magazine listed Yakinchuk among the 100 most influential people in the arts in Ukraine. Her new play, Wall, was produced at the Ivan Franco National Academic Drama Theatre, the largest and oldest Ukrainian theatre. Her poems have been translated into 20 languages. She has received a number of awards including three of Ukraine's most prestigious awards for young poets. In 2022, she performed her poem Prayer in a project called Free by John Legend during the Grammy Awards. So 
the Yuba's title is I Have a Crisis for You. I have a crisis for you. You lit up a cigarette, but it wouldn't burn. It was summer. And girls would light up from any passerby. But I didn't light up from you anymore. Our love's gone missing. I explained to a friend that vanished in one of the wars we waged in our kitchen. Change the word war to crisis, he suggests. Because a crisis is something everyone has from time to time. Remember the Second World Crisis? Correspondingly, also the First World Civil Crisis, to each his own. I forgot about the Cold Crisis. It seems they also came in twos. Also the Uprising Crisis. It sounds so good. The Uprising Crisis of 1648 to 1657. Write it down in the notebooks. A crisis that liberates releases forever. My great-grandfather fell in the Second World Crisis, possibly by the hand of my other great-grandfather, or his machine gun, or his battle tank. But it is unclear how they conducted this crisis with each other. Perhaps it was the crisis itself that killed them, like a plague. For nobody is to blame for the crisis. It is inexorable like death. And how our own domestic war turns into crisis, does it get better? Does it hurt less? Do birds come back to us from the south? Or maybe we come out to meet them? Why is our language like that? We lack the words to describe our feelings. Only crisis and love are left as antonyms. But if love is bound to be so complicated, with these blazes and smoulderings like blood and pain, and blood is not like periods, but some new feeling of mine, and pain is yours. If love is made up of two different feelings, then soon love will also be called crisis. I have a crisis for you, darling. Let's get married. It'll be easier for us both. We've got a crisis. We'd better split up. <laughs> And that's translated from the Ukrainian by Svetlana Lavrovitsa, published in the photo collection Apricots of Donbass in 2021 in the USA. And just to mention on a happier note, just before going to the next poem, um, in Dumfries and Galloway, we have welcomed a lot of Ukrainian families just now. Mm. It's actually really lovely. Um, there's quite a lot being done to help um, with accommodation and with access to lots of facilities around the Reason Gallery um, with free bus passes and free access to various children's um, places of fun and entertainment. Um, I have a bundle coming here in the morning, in fact, for coffee, cakes. And so just to say there's a really really nice um, situation, as much as we can provide for some of the people who've come over from Ukraine. Um, they're getting their biometric tests and hoping to get some work. It's, it's very hard for them. They don't know how long they'll be here. Or just the situation is always in their mind of what's going on back home. They're not tourists. We have to keep reminding ourselves when we try to provide nice things to do. They're not tourists, you know, they have this going on in their mind all the time, but um, we, we try to do what we can. So this poem I'm going to read is by Gerda Stevenson, and it's coming out in the, the, the magazine that's about to be launched. Gerda can't make it tonight. Gerda's an award-winning writer, actor, director, singer-songwriter. Her poetry, drama and prose are widely published, staged and broadcast. Her play Federer vs. Murray toured to New York, nominated as M.D. Alba Scott Singer of the Year for her album Night Touches Day. Her poetry If This Were Real and Quines, both also published in Rome by Edizioni Ensemble in Italian translations, and Inside and Out, The Art of Christian Small, with the landscape photographer Alan Wright. She has a collection of short stories also called Letting Go. And she, um, she sent in her submission for 
tenings, all the submissions that are entered for tenings are anonymous. The editorial group, which is Moira McPartland, myself, and Samina Chaudhry, um, the, the, the entries are always anonymous and the, the names are removed from the entries before they come in. So it's actually really, really interesting afterwards to see, oh, that's who, that's who it's by. So this is one that we really loved called Russian Glove. I happened to be wearing them that Sunday morning. News of Ukraine bleeding from the radio as I left the house to join neighbours at our local attraction, the Red Coffee Van. A new heartbeat drawing us together. A constant trickle for an hour or so along the village arteries. Life after the virus opening up. The aroma of freshly ground beans teasing our nostrils in the frosted air. And there, in the car park, our ankles fringed by snowdrops. White lanterns expanding in the sun. My gloves are admired for their intricate pattern. Freelance style with a tap touch. Eggshell blue, yellow and green. Spring colours to lift their spirits, someone says. And I remind her of the Russian women who lived for a while over the hill. Became my friend and made them for me. Deft fingers flicking wool between needles cut. Those supple expert hands I know so well, and often think of in everything we do. Then a man says it, casts a tiny grenade into the morning. So they'll be for the bin, won't they? And a small cloud of hatred hangs in the cellar view. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, Vashabi um, is, um, Vashabi has arrived. She's obviously thought that um, it was a, a 7.30 start. We've been going for an hour, Vashabi, <laughs> and we read your poems. I'm really um, sorry. I, I don't know why I, uh, that happened, but. Well, yeah. would you like to say something about India and the situation with, with Ukraine? Because I think that we have, you know, we have a very Western-centric media, don't we? And, and you know, Asia has a, a big part to play, I imagine. Um, mm -hmm. Well, it's... Uh, India has a long-standing relationship with Russia, historically, uh, because soon after Indian independence, uh, India faced especially under Indira Gandhi, uh, the fear of famine. And Indira did something that nobody else had been able to do. She went to Russia and she went to America. And she was, I think, a very charming woman. And the two men at that time in the two countries found her irresistible. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, she got help from both countries by way of grain, a promise of grain, wheat. So, and in her father's time, Nehru, who was the first chief uh, prime minister of India, he got a lot of help from Russia with heavy industries, which was a, we now know it, it was a ba bad investment. So from then on, we've had a, India has had a very positive uh, relationship with Russia. Uh, we grew up reading uh, Russian novels, uh, and uh, poetry in translation, uh, which were affordable because we couldn't afford to buy books from the West because they were prohibitive, uh, their prices. So when Ukraine happened, this long-standing relationship, one hoped, would stand the world in good stead. Um, India has a vast number of people who can't afford the current prices of uh, fuel. And that is where Russia comes in. And India is still buying oil from Russia. And India is afraid uh, to point out what Russia is doing in Ukraine is wrong, I think. That's my personal opinion. But the opinion of many of my friends, India is also worried about China. And China 
as India sees it, is a friend of Russia. And India doesn't want to rock the boat because we already have China occupying quite a bit of India. Mm. Uh, and India hasn't actually been able to fought, fight back. So these three big powers are in a kind of triangular, very difficult relationship. And I hope that India will exert her uh, power as a, the world's largest democracy to influence Russia to some sort of understanding that will put an end to this devastating conflict and may then be a go between, between the East and the West, between China and the West as well. Mm. So that's, that's uh, where I would leave it, but it's, yeah. it's a hope. It's what many journalists and political analysts are uh, saying, and uh, we can only live in hope, I think. Yeah, I think it bears out what uh, Alexis's thesis of, mm -hmm. of toxic neutrality, actually, when you do nothing, mm -hmm. then, you, you know, you, you endorse the person and there is no impunity. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I'm going to just want to say thank you, Bashabi. I, I think the Indian perspective was very important, so I'm glad you talked about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And my apologies again, Jean. This was totally unintended. I, I, I phoned you. I phoned you, but, but there didn't seem to be anybody. <laughs> well, my phone has been on silent because I was. Uh, at a meeting earlier, but I came back ages ago and I hadn't realized it was on site. Oh, so I was oh. actually at home. No, my oh. <laughs> Next time. Yes. Um, I, I'm going to read a poem of my own now. Um, it, I suppose this question of of impunity is 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 eating away at us all. Um, uh, a, a member of Dovetail said to me, you know, that Ukraine really taxes her and she has to look back at, at all the peace campaigners of the past just to remind herself that, that peace is the important thing here. Um, and we seem to have lost sight of it, you know. We, at the beginning of this war, there was some kind of um, mention of peace talks, but it's gradually receded. Um, and I, I think, I suppose I, I, I t agree with Alexis, this should not be, people shouldn't be allowed to get away with it. But for me, the question is, how will that happen? I, I don't have any great hopes it will. So this poem is called International Justice. An English castle, 1390. The Lord of the Manor decides. Deep in his dungeon, heavy iron racks, where traitors are twisted and tortured, or skewered like pigs. They laugh when they hear them scream. Nuremberg, 1946. International justice decides. Due process was given to those who thought themselves above the law. The judgment, severe and final. They sighed with relief when it was all over. Romania, Christmas Day, 1989. The army decides. The dictator and his wife try to flee, but the helicopter is brought down. A drumhead trial at high speed. The order to hang them, handwritten in the lavatory. They shoot hands at a job well done. Iran. 2006, Blair and Bush decide, quarter of a million dead, but all they care about are oil and weapons that never existed. The dictator cowers in a hole in the dirt, is brought out in his underpants. They jeered at his hanging, filmed it on a mobile phone. Pakistan, 2011. Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton decide. They name their mission after a Hollywood film. 
send in the seals in a cover op to kill the man who blazoned his hate over the New York skyline, the ultimate theater of war. They cheered in the White House as they watched his death on screen. Ukraine 2020, who decides? Russia creates a desert of the world's breadbasket, a ghost country where millions have fled their homes. The world's future hangs in the balance. The attacker should be brought to trial, but they'll never dare. <coughs> Will we just follow the money? Thank you. Mm. Okay. Mm. Um, our penultimate poet, um, is A.C. Clark, who has um, published five collections and six pamphlets. Um, two of the pamphlets are set in Androchid, uh, were in collaboration with Maggie Rabatsky and Sheila Templeton and used all the languages of Scotland, English, Scots and Gaelic. Um, Actually, Sheila Templeton's really the Doric, isn't she? So that's a fourth, I think. Um, her fifth full collection, A Troubling Woman, came out in 2017. Um, and she was one of four winners in the Cinnamon Press pamphlet competition that year with War Baby. She's been working on an extensive series about, of poems about Paul and Gala Eloard, later Gala Dali and the surrealist circles in which they moved. It's a bit of a departure for her, and I, I love these poems, they're great. The first was published as a pamphlet by Tap Saltieri last year. This year, she's been involved with other writers and artists in a project inspired by Gart Naval Royal Hospital and initiated by Gillian McDougall. And uh, AC Clark, and I'm going to ask her to, let us see her, yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jean. Um, well, rather, well, Jean gave us a, a very wide sweeping historical perspective. Um, I suppose, in a sense, my poem does. Uh, it's a very basic poem, which I wrote in a hurry for this event, I have to say. And, uh, it ought to, its title is Send Warm Socks, which I'm sure everyone knows, the well-known letter from a Roman soldier on Hadrian's Wall writing home, and he needed the warm socks up on Hadrian's Wall. And an alternative title, which really tells you what the poem is about, is Same Old, Same Old. Send Warm Socks, writes the centurion, shivering in a godforsaken outpost of empire. Send more swords and better, think the clansmen, turfed off his land by strangers who don't speak his language. Make it stop, cry those caught in the crossfire, who never started what may end them, being born where they were born, no say in the matter. Send good boots, writes the soldier, transferring a quagmire of tank traps. Send more guns and better, thinks the citizen, turfed off his land by strangers who won't speak his language. And those caught in the crossfire, who never started what may end them, being born where they were born, cry, Make it stop. Thank you. Okay, we have come to our final um, poet here, uh, Tom Hubbard. Uh, Tom Hubbard was the first librarian of the Scottish Poetry Library and is the author of 10 books of fiction, poetry and nonfiction, and editor or co-editor of many others. His most recent book is The Devil and Michael Scott, published by Grace Note. The Emerald Passport, his lecture on the um, Jechenyi Academy, uh, 
of arts and letters has just been published. Um, it's a Hungarian. The, this annual lecture is presented by the Academy most recently on Zoom and is sponsored by the Irish Embassy in Budapest. Uh, he's also recently contributed to an anthology of essays on Hamish Henderson, which is called uh, Hamish Henderson Conversation Piece, which is edited by Charles Naismith, the, the artist Charles Naismith. Um, so, now a selection of his essays and talks, Invitation to the Voyage, Scotland Literature in Europe is forthcoming from Rhymer Books. So over to you, Tom. Can you hear me? I'm not sure if I'm mute or not. We can hear you. We yeah, can. can hear you, yeah. You're right. Okay, this is called Ranting Writes Rap. And I'll be using a variety of voices. God save America, America, save God, 45th Pres. Let us now loudly holler, land of the gun and dollar, private wealth, public squalor, our Bible says we're going to get away with it. Ladies and gentlemen, let us bomb Yemen. We'll fake pious pain over Ukraine, send dark skins to Rwanda, a tired propaganda wins over the gullible, whose IQ's terrible. I think we'll get away with it. Promises on the side of a bus. Putin Patel, Trumpy Truss. We'll wink at the bobby. Get on with the jobby. Draw a line and move on. We're unmoved, won't be drawn. Lefty lawyers and bishops hate freedom for bishops. Pippa pig, hiccups. They'll forget all that shit. We'll get away with it. We'll vow to deliver, level up, or whatever. First Lord of the Cesspit, crony contracts, Brexit. We'll crush those woke rowdies, suck up to the Saudis. Let the oiks starve and, and freeze. We'll announce a new wheeze. We'll grope, puke, and plunder. Let the dying earth wonder how we got away with it. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Great well, ending. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. And Jean, if you're... Yeah, thank you. Thank you all very much. It's been... And particularly thank you to Mario for yeah. setting this whole thing up and, and uh, it's been great and to have a joint event with Penn mm -hmm. and thank you to Scottish Penn for hosting it. Uh, that took the responsibility away from me, thank you. And, uh, <laughs> um, and thank you of course to all the people who spoke, to Alexis who came from Geneva, yes. from, to Donald, who, who's staying up late now in Finland, and to all the poets who read, thank you very much. And to Bashabi, because you moved us to tears with your poetry. Yes. yes. <laughs> thank you, and my apologies again, Jim. And thank you for including me. Uh, yeah. Thank you all very much. Night. Thanks, thank you, Jean. Jean. Bye, night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks to everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.